Well, thank you, Aaron and Anna and worship team. So thanks so much for that. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see y'all be here. Welcome to Foundations Church on Memorial Day weekend. When uh, when God repeats something, that means it's important to him, right? So the commandment that's repeated most in the Bible, you hear that a lot here, the commandment that's repeated most in the Bible is fear not. 365 times it appears in the Bible because God knows that, you know what, we uh, have a lot of fear in life. We struggle with it a lot. So don't worry about it. I got it. I got it. The second most repeated commandment in the Bible is remember. It's easy to forget. It's easy to forget how great God is to us. So on this weekend, that's dedicated to remembering that we live in an amazing country, a great deal of freedom, a lot of prosperity, to remember that that didn't come easy or cheap or free. It costs a lot. And so today, we're going to dedicate this whole service kind of to remembering, kind of to remember. When, um, when uh, Israel, when, when the town of Jerusalem was being destroyed around 586 B.C., uh, the prophet Jeremiah was watching the city be destroyed. He was up on a hilltop and he was watching the city just be destroyed. And uh, he, he, he wrote a letter called Lamentations. He was lamenting over the destruction of a city that he loved. And as he's watching the fire and the smoke and the town just get run over and buildings be destroyed, in the middle of his lament, he's feeling bad about what happened, he writes these words. In the middle of his lament, he says this, God's compassions never fail. Amen. Even when things seem absolutely destroyed, that God is good. He's good. His compassions, they never, ever, ever fail. Even when life seems to be about as dark as dark can get, God is still reaching out with compassion. We're going to learn about that today. I'm really, really, really glad you're here. Welcome to Foundations Church, everyone. So, we're going to, in just a second, I'm going to ask you to stand, because we're going to learn about a story where a man went into a very dark place, and it was in that dark place that God's compassion <coughs> met him. He wasn't even aware of it, and he did great and mighty things. So, we're going to learn today a little bit about the life of a man named Samson. So I invite you all to stand. I want you to follow along with me as we're going to step right in the middle of a conversation with the man of God and his weakness. We're going to read right now about the deliberation of a conflicted soul. Your soul ever been in conflict? You want something, you really want it bad, but you know it's probably not the best for you live in this place of conflict. We're going to step right in the middle of this conflict that Samson is having as he has a dialogue with this mistress named Delilah. Watch this. Follow along as I read. Delilah said to Samson, how can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? Any married men ever hear those words? I'm just kidding, all right? Just wondering, okay? All right? All right? Some guys are like, yes, I have, okay? How? She's in the bedroom. We kind of get a little glimpse into the bedroom talk here. And she says, how can you say that you love me when your heart's not here? You've deceived me three times. And you have not told me where your great strength is. It came about when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him daily that his soul was annoyed to death. <laughs> How many men do we want to ask that question? <laughs> but you know what? Sometimes you cave into stuff just because you're tired of resisting. You know what I'm talking about? It's just a daily, daily fight. You just say, I don't want to resist anymore. Foolishly thinking that if I cave in and I resist, I will be released from the struggle when in fact the struggle just intensifies all the more. Can you relate to what I'm talking about this morning? So he told her 
all that was in his all that was in his and said to her a razor has never come on my head right in Nazareth we'll talk about what that means to God when I was in even from my mother's womb if I'm shaved you cut off my long hair then my strength will leave me and I will become weak and be like any other man. That's exactly what you don't want to be. Like any other man. Amen. Any other person. God has made you extraordinary. He doesn't want you to be normal. Puts me ahead of the group a little bit. Okay, right? <laughs> he doesn't want you to be a conformist and fit in with the crowd. God wants his people to be extraordinary. There's two things that God uses. He wants to use a person. One is their weakness, is in our weakness he is made strong. And the other is our uniqueness. And the world tries to take both of those away from us. That's why we walk around looking strong. You don't hear many people walk around being weak. The world doesn't tolerate that old barbecue if you do that. So we cover up and pretend that we're stronger than we really are. And then we pretend that the, the world, even our education system, works hard to conform everybody. Take away your uniqueness. Don't be special. Fit in. And Samson said, I'm unique. I was born unique in my mother's womb. I was unique. But if you cut my hair, I'm going to be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her, all that was in his, all that was in his, she sent for the Philistines. Isn't it amazing how people can be so nice to you until they get what they want and then turn on you? Here she's seducing him, comforting him. And as soon as he tells her all his heart, she turns on him in an instant. She calls the Philistines, saying this, Come up here. He has told me all that is in his. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money she was paid to seduce him. She made him sleep on her knees and called for a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his hair. Then she began to afflict him. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing that sometimes people who can be so nice can turn out to be so nasty. You ever known anybody like that? Don't point. Just want to know. Okay. Here she is comforting him every night. Comforting, trying to get to the secret of his heart. And as soon as she gets it, she turns nasty. And she said these words. His strength left him. And the fish, she said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. Samson heard that many times. And every time the Philistines were upon him, his supernatural strength and the that ended up to give him great, great victory. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he woke from a sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. Isn't it interesting that sometimes when you're really close to God, you can do things and God does great things, but you drift away from God deceitfully thinking that if I do these same things over here without God's blessing, I'll get the same result. Do you know what I'm talking about this morning? You see, he's doing the same things, but God's favor has left. And now Samson thought that he'd be able to do the same things he did back here, but he's not the same man that he used to be. He said, I will go out of other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Then the Philistines seized him, the strong man. And the first thing they do is they gouge out his eyes. And they brought him down to Gaza. Huh, we hear that not one in the news, don't we? Yeah, they brought him to Gaza and bound him. Isn't it interesting? The first thing they did, they didn't bind him right away when his strength left. They got his eyes out first. Then they bound him with bronze chains. And he was a grinder in the prison. He would grind grain. The powerful man of God is now yoked to an ox, grinding grain. Yoked to an ox. No friends anymore. His friend is his ox. You could usually tell how you're doing in life by the people you hang around with. 
This is good so far, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I don't know how the rest will go, but so far we're all good, okay? And you brought a buddy, Brown and Brown James, if he was a grinder in prison. However, here he is. Eyes gouged out, bent back, shaved head, doing a job that's way beneath his dignity. Have you ever done that? Grinding. However, in the dungeon, <laughs> in the grinder, in the darkness, the hair of his head began to grow. And then after, at the end, even after, it was shaved off. God's compassion meets him in the dungeon of his life. All self imposed. All done by, 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 by Samson. But it was there. He didn't even know it. His eyes were gouged out. He didn't even know that he was grinding with the eyes. But the hair on his head began to grow. I'm glad you're here this morning. Father, we thank you for the amazing privilege we have. We probably take it for granted that we can meet so freely, so openly, open up the Word of God and talk about it. So we thank you today. Thank you for the freedom, the prosperity, the amazing country that we live in. Thank you for that. And we humbly say thank you for the people who provided our freedom for us that for so many times we take for granted. Thank you for the word of God we have this morning. In a world that sometimes goes fast, we can lose our way, it gets fuzzy. We need a compass. We need, we, we need some help to navigate through this crazy world. Thank you for the word of God. But it gives us direction. It gives us light in the darkness. It gives us comfort in our distress. It tells us the way to go. So today, Father, all of us here, we have different degrees of struggle, challenge, things we're wrestling with. May we see that we serve a big, big, big God. Heighten our expectations of who you are. I hope we don't just want to come to a church service today. I hope we want to come and get reconnected to the God of who reminds us that with him all things are possible. May we believe you. Thank you for this opportunity. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And you can grab a seat. We're gonna we're gonna talk through um, the, 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 the life of Samson and tell you how God's compassion never fails. So we're gonna do it kind of like a play a little bit. Seven scenes in this play. We'll go through them really quickly because I want to ride my bike today. Okay? So seven scenes. And so uh, and we've done this before, but I just want to be sure you're connected with me because some of you are in the memorial day mode. So I want to say stay connected. And then you can go in the memorial day mode. Okay? So after every scene, after every scene, I'm going to say get it. You say got it. I say good. We go to the next scene. Okay? Get it? Got good, got it, good, that's good, that's good. Stay away from there, all right? Okay, so here we go. Scene number one is called the, act number one is called the? Let me give you the context of what's going on. God has led his people through the wilderness out of Egypt, brought them into the promised land. That's where we are right now in this story, in the promised land. God said this, he said, here's the deal. I don't want you to be like any other country. I'm going to be different. So I'm going to be your king. God said, I'll be your king. Because when you're connected to me, then, then you'll understand how I work and how we bless your land. He says, there's no separation, so to speak, back then, of church and state. God was saying, what you do morally is absolutely connected to what happens civilly in your country. Are you all with me this morning? You can't connect the two. They're very connected. So God set up this thing called a theocracy, where God is in charge of the country. God is the one who runs the country. All the countries around Israel were ruled by what they call a monarchy, which means one person's in charge. One person is running. And if the person's a good person, the country doesn't care. If the person's not a bad, not a good person, the country flounders. And so this is the time that we're in. They didn't have a king yet. Eventually, Israel would want a king. We want to be like the other countries. And God says, no, 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 don't do that. 
don't do that. I'm nicer than human beings are. You know what? And so eventually they did. They would have a king. Their first king was King Saul. And when the king started coming, the first thing the kings did was raise taxes. But we're not there yet. We're not there yet. They're a theocracy. The countries around them are a monarchy. The United States is a republic, a democracy, which is a government of the people, by the people. Are you guys citizens, by the way? <laughs> just checking, okay? Just checking, okay? So they're a theocracy. Since they don't have a king, they have certain rulers, not a king, kind of governors, they call them judges. The very book word, judges, is an indication. That's a period word, judges. They have judges, judging time. Samson will be the 12th judge. will be the 12th. That's an interesting kind of thing, because whenever God sets up some kind of government, 12 seems to be a very important number to him for some reason. When he starts with the nation of Israel, he has how many tribes? 12. Okay? When Jesus calls his disciples, he calls how many? 12. Okay? Samson is the 12th judge. Okay? During this time, the Israelites are being beaten up by a group of people called the Philistines. That's the Philistines. And God says, I'm not going to have my people keep being built up, I mean beat up by the Philistines. I need someone who's going to rise up and give the people courage to fight the Philistines. And so he will raise up the 12th judge, whose name is? That's Act 1, the context. Get it? Good. Act 2 which is called what? The commission. God didn't want his people to get beat up by the Philistines. So he, an angel visits a couple who are without child. The man's name is Manoah. And the angel comes and says, you're going to have a baby. He is going to be a judge. And they make the mom make this Nazarite vow. Okay, now here's what the Nazarite vow is. The Nazarite vow is this kid it's going to be commissioned. He's going to be special. You have to treat him special. He's not going to be like everybody. He's not going to be normal. He's not going to be ordinary. He's going to be extra. From the mother's womb, he's going to be extraordinary. So there's certain things that when a person makes a natural vow, they can't do. One thing they can't do is they can't cut their hair, ever. Never get a haircut. So he's going to have long hair. I want you to get this. The hair of an Nazarite vow is an internal, the Bible calls covenant, we'll say agreement or commitment. A Nazarite vow is an internal commitment made with your heart. Are you all tracking with me? With your heart. The outward manifestation of the inward agreement is the hair. The hair is just the outward symbol of something that was done Internally, are you all with me this morning? Okay, the hair is not that important, it's the heart that's important. God does this all the time when He set up the nation of Israel, He had us, He had them make a commitment to be His special people, and they gave my outward sign circumcision. Oh, oh, okay, circumcision was an outward symbol of an inward agreement. You all with me? We do it in, in our church. In our church, we have baptisms. Baptisms are outward signs. The baptism in and of itself is important. It's an important. It's not just if somebody in water. That's important. It's an outward sign of an inward agreement. Okay? Uh, I wear this. This is the wedding ring. This is an outward sign of an inward agreement, commitment, covenant that I've made with Vicki. I do sometimes men retreat. They're kind of rough or regular or whatever. And so we have the men give us their jewelry, cell phones and everything. One time, this guy said, I'm not going to give you my wedding ring. I'm married to my wife. And my buddy said, well, sir, that's just an outward sign. Submitting your ring has nothing to do with the health of Marriage. I'm not gonna do it. Okay, dude, settle down. All right, I love you. All right, all right. Great. Okay. 
But this is, when I work out, when I work out, because I lift heavy, you know? <laughs> That's not funny. <laughs> I take my ring off to put it in the locker when I work out, okay? So I don't want the fire hitting me. So that has nothing to do with the status of our relationship with the outward sign of an inward agreement. Y'all with me? Samson had long hair, but the hair was just long, long, it was just an outward sign, it was long hair. That's the commission. That's Act 2. Get it? Right. Good. Act 3 is called? The catastrophe. Here's what happened. The promised land is occupied by seven tribes called the Canaanites. Okay? The Canaanites are mean and nasty people. And God said, you can't marry any of the Canaanites. Can't do it. It had nothing to do with racial purity and everything to do with spiritual purity. He said, I don't want you because you have this value system. They have that value system. If you marry, it will be the intermingling of different value systems will create a problem. Y'all with me? Also in the promised land were these group of people called the Philistines. The Philistines were not Canaanites. They moved in there. They were kind of a Semitic people. And they were allowed, it wasn't encouraged, but they were allowed to marry Philistines. They weren't opposed, to, they weren't allowed to marry Canaanites. Samson went down and hung out with the Philistines. These are the people they're at war with. His dad said, it's not a good idea to do that, Samson. Samson nevertheless fell in love with a Philistinian woman. And his dad wasn't happy because they have a different base. It's what the Apostle Paul says when he talks to Christians and says this. I don't want believers in God to be unequally yoked. I don't want believers in God to marry someone who's not a believer in God, not because anybody's any better than anybody. It has nothing to do with that. All people have the same problems. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 heathen marriages, they fight. Christian marriages, they fight. Heathen marriages cheat. Christian marriages cheat. We all have the same problems. The difference is, why he wants you to be unequally yoked, is that when you do have problems, people go to different places for power, for their help. Are you all with me this morning? Okay? And so, but Samson went to the Philistines, and he, he married this Philistine woman. And, and the Philistines are at war. So they, they, they want to get God strong. So what they do is they kidnap, they kind of kidnap Samson's wife, and they have her have an affair with Samson's best man. Oh, you want to mess with a man, mess with this woman. That'll tick the guy off from her. So Samson, he's mad. He's really mad. Back home in Ohio, we called it, he went ape mad. Oh, he was mad. He was ticked out. You don't mess with my woman. And so he got a bunch of foxes together, Samson did. And he tied their, and he, and, and he lit their tails on fire and had them run through the crops. And all their crops caught on fire and burned them down. Now that's a problem when you live in an agrarian culture that doesn't have money. Because not only do you destroy the food supply, you also destroy the, you also destroy their money. They have no way to trade. Are you all with me? They don't have no way. So they're mad. Oh boy, Samson really ticked off the Philistines. You want to mess with a man, you mess with his money. Oh, he'll get real mad. So the Philistines then took Samson's wife, killed her, killed her, and they killed her father too. So Samson lost his wife. And he lost his father-in-law, and then Samson made a commitment in his heart. You could read about it. He says, I will retaliate. They will not get away with this. I'm going to retaliate. They're going to pay for this. And Samson would rule for 20 years as a judge of Israel. And the whole time, he was this angry dude fighting against the Philistines. But if you look closer, he really wasn't fighting, his anger wasn't really fighting against the Philistines. His anger was fighting against himself. Are y'all with me this morning? Here's what I found out about angry people. Here's what I found out about angry people. There's some in the room here. Angry people aren't really angry at the other that they supposedly are angry at. They're actually fighting an internal battle. They're really angry about themselves. And Philip, he was angry. He was really, really angry. So he would rule, he would rule with a, with, with a hole in his heart. And the, the woman that he loved was 
was taken away and killed brutally. He was ruled in 20 years with, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a hole in his heart. That's Act 3. Get it? Good. Act 4. What's that saying? Oh, this is good. This is good. Okay. He's mad. He's angry. He's ruling with a hole in his heart. And the Philistines, they know, they know they can't, uh, they can't oppose Samson. He's too strong. One time they locked him in a city overnight. And when he got up, he just picked up the city gates. He was so strong. Carried him away. <laughs> One time they came at him with swords and he didn't have anything. He found an old dead donkey, took the jawbone of the donkey as his weapon, and killed a thousand Philistines. This dude was nasty. He was nasty. He was tough. Now, I want to tell you something. I believe, I believe Samson's strength was supernatural. Because in the passage that we read, here's what the lady said. She said, Samson, tell me what is the source of your strength. Now, that's a weird question, is it not? You wouldn't go up to Arnold Schwarzenegger or The Rock and say, hey, tell me why you're so strong. It's obvious. The dude's got bulging biceps, rippling triceps. His pecs are hanging out. He's got a six pack. <laughs> but you wouldn't go to a guy like that and say, where do you get your strength? Uh-uh, uh-uh. You go to someone and ask them, where do you get your strength from? When they don't look strong, they are strong. <laughs> you get me? He had a supernatural strength. He didn't look strong. He just was strong. Oh, I like that. You know why I like that? It reminds me of folks, folks here. That's why I greet people when they come in the door. Every week it reminds me. We got a lot of people in our church who are fighting cancer. They walk in the door. They don't look strong. But they are strong. I saw a man sit here every, every 9 o'clock service. I see here this morning. 40 years married to his wife and came to church every day, every week together. And his wife was taken away from him. Unexpectedly. And now he comes to church every week by himself. Sits in his seat by himself. Every week. Looks at me and calls me St. Carl from a message I gave a long time ago. Hey, St. Carl, how you doing? With a big smile. Doesn't look strong. It's strong. You got that? I see people here, their kids are spinning out of control. Lost control of their kids. Oh, it just aches, pulls on their heart and their happiness. Oh, they, they're here every week. They don't look strong. They just are strong. You know what I'm talking about? I talked to a guy this week. I talked to a guy this week. He said, you know what, Carl? He said, I look at my checkbook. He said, I don't know how I drive the car I drive in the house I have. He said, I don't look blessed, but I am blessed. I like that. You know what I'm talking about? Ever had that in life? We don't have a lot of money, but things are going good. You don't know how things are happening because it's good. They don't look blessed. You don't have to be blessed. You don't have to look blessed to be blessed. And so the craftiness is they have to get, they have to find the secret. They have to find the secret to Samson's strength. He's crushing them. So what they do is they know their Philistinian, his Philistinian wife has been killed. And now Samson is ruling with a hole in his heart. So what they do is they hire a slut, a promiscuous woman named Delilah, a Philistinian woman. Looks like her, but not her. Talks like her, but not her. <laughs> Touches like her. That's Act 4. Get it? Good. To Act 5, which is called? Now the conflict is escalated in, 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 in Samson's life. Now it's escalated. Because here's the problem. He's in love with a woman from the people that he hates. He's having an affair. He's lying down in bed with someone that at one level he loves, but at the same level he hates. Y'all with me? Because now the woman that he's sleeping with, because she gives him something that he wants, 
It's, it's, it's rest from a weary soul. Now the conflict gets escalated because now the woman he's sleeping with is trying to kill him. It's one thing to lay down with someone who's trying to kill you and you don't know it. It's a whole other thing to lay down with somebody and you know they're trying to kill you. And I know that Samson knows she's trying to kill you because every time he asks, every time she asks him, what's the source of your strength? He has the tenacity and the smarts to lie to her. Y'all with me? He knows. He knows. He knows that she's trying to get him. But the problem is, he's ruling with a hole in his heart. Have you ever had to do a job with a hole in your heart? The, the, the company doesn't care that you have a hole in your heart. You still got to hit those numbers, even though you don't have any drive in you. They're asking stuff from you that you don't think you have. You go home to your family and they ask stuff of you, but you just don't have the energy to meet. You go to a family reunion, every respect should be happy, but you ain't happy. Can y'all relate to what I'm talking about? You have a hole in your heart. And so, and so he's driven to this woman. He's driven to this woman. I don't, I don't believe it's sexual, because the Bible doesn't say anything about their hot, carnivorous sexual relationship in hotel rooms. It talks more about Samson just going, Oh, I need a place to rest my weary head. And it's in the weariness that he puts his head in her lap, and her touch and her voice, voice soothes him. He, he needs it. But it's going to be painful to kill him. Desperate people do desperate things. Are you with me? Huh? Yeah, we'll, we'll do desperate. We, we, we would be surprised this morning how many desperate people are in the room here. Desperate for love. Desperate for appreciation. Desperate for validation. Desperate for someone just to care for them. And so Samson, while he knows she's trying to kill him, finds comfort as he puts his head in her lap. What do you do when you live with conflicting urges. You ever been there? Huh? It's like a moth to the flame. There's something natural, innate, and instinctive with the moth being drawn to the light. But there's something, that's something natural, innate, instinctive to be repulsed. Moth does this dangerous dance. I go to the light that I crave at the risk of being burned by the heat that I hate. Can you relate to me this morning? Huh? The room's awfully quiet here. <laughs> okay? It's a moth to a flame. There's some people here today that God would want to say this. Just get it off me and say, the light that you're pursuing right now is coming at too great of an expense of what the heat is doing to your life. I've been there. I know what it's like. You're drawn to the light. Gotta have it. Gotta have it. I'm obsessed with it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. Oh, it's gonna be painful. Oh, it might kill me. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I need it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. I gotta have it. And so this is the quandary, the conundrum. That Samson finds himself in. And that is Act 5 conflict. Get it? Yes. Good. Act 6 is called. Yes. Now we get a window to the bedroom talk of Samson and Delilah. She goes to the bedroom and she says, this, How can you say that you love me? That means he was talking smack to her. You know what I'm talking about? He got in the living room and he said, Honey, I love you. Baby. Rock my world. Oh, baby, I love you. Oh, you rock my world. It's amazing what men will say to get what they want to get. And then they get to the bedroom, and just as he's addressing the woman, says, how can you say that you love me? Why do you, well, you do that? By the way, I just want to know. Not that I'm pretty in the bedroom talk here. Okay, all right? And she says, how can you tell me that you love me? You've deceived me three times when I asked for the source of your strength. And now he's caught in this dilemma. He's finding comfort in the love of a woman who's trying to kill her, but he needs that comfort. 
desperate to give him God a hole in his heart. He's desperately in need of love and validation. And so in that moment of weakness, he says, if you cut my hair, if you cut my hair, then I'll be like any other man. I'll be like any other man. The minute she hears that, she calls for the men. <laughs> Come get up! Come get up! And they come into the room. The first thing they do is they gouge out his eyes. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. Are y'all with me? You got, here's what you need to know this morning. What God wants is people with vision. You, you, you could be poor, but if you have vision, you're dangerous. You could be uneducated, but if you have a vision, you could be dangerous. You could be unemployed, but if you have a vision, you could be dangerous. You could be divorced and floundering in the aftermath of that, but if you have a vision, you're dangerous. Watch out for a person who doesn't have a vision, because <laughs> they aren't very powerful. They can't do a whole lot. And the first thing they do is they gouge out Samson's eye, take away his vision. And then what they do is they take away, um, get this, Samson laid his head on Delilah's heart, I mean, Samson's head on her lap, and then it says the Bible says, he told her all his heart. She couldn't get his hair, y'all with me, until she got his two things. Be careful where you put your head. Be careful where you lie down. Be careful. Be careful when you tell your heart to. Be careful. She tried to find his face. She couldn't get to the hair until she got to the heart. Once she got to the heart, then she got to the hair. The hair is just an outward manifestation of something that's happened to you. So then what she did is she took the shave of the man and shaved all the locks off the senses. Ray, I don't mean to disappoint. I don't mean to call you out, Ray. Can you stand up, please, Ray? There's Samson. Very <laughs> right there. The head's completely shaved with star shining, the light is shining. Okay? And it's just that's it. He lost it. And so they take him to a dungeon. And there he begins to be tied to an ox. And just right. Shaved head. Eyes gouged out. Bent back. Doing stuff way beneath his dignity and his calling. Are y'all with me? He grinds. He grinds. It's a dark place. <laughs> it's a dark place. It's a dark place. You can't see. The strong man of God has now become a pitiful picture, mocked by the Philistines, mocked, ridiculed. That's Act 6, the crash. Get it? Yeah. Act Number seven is called the compassion of God. We read this morning, what? Never fails. You got to get that this morning. Never fails. Never fails. <coughs> the compassion of God never fails. You need to remember that. Even when you're in a dark place, <laughs> at your own doing, the compassion of God never fails. As he's grinding, his hair begins to grow. They have a big party in Philistine, in the, in the land of the Philistines. They have a big party. They're underneath this big, 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 big kind of building. And it says, after, the Bible says, after their spirits were high, you know what that means? They were drinking a lot. Some of you are to mind. Okay? They were drinking a lot. They were drinking a lot, having a big time. They say, hey! Hey! One verse it says, we need to have some sport. We need to make sport. Hey, what about that Jewish dude who thought he was big, but thinks his God's all that? Get him! High in spirits want to mock somebody. And so they bring out the powerful man who now is a pitiful man of God, Samson. And they say, let's look at that. Hey, tell us how strong your God is, Samson. You could imagine the insults that were fired at his direction. Fired at him. Samson didn't know because he's in a dungeon and he can't see. But then his hair began to grow. Now, it's not about the hair. It's always about the heart. So 
I want you to know something. While Samson was grinding in that dark place, day in and day out, something was happening in his that his hair began to grow. And out there, while everybody's making fun of him, he asked them, he said, I'm too tired of standing. Can you can I just lean against some pillars as he's bound and shackled in his chains? And so these guys said, okay, whatever. And they have him lean against these poles because he said he was tired. He really wasn't tired. He prayed to God one more time because God was working in his heart as his hair began to grow. And he pushed against those pillars and down came that big building and crushed it killed more Philistines in that one instant than Samson had done his entire life. As I read the Bible, here's what I find out. The great people of God always grow most in the darkness. Y'all with me? In the darkness. Jacob deceived his family. A conniver and a deceiver on run away from his family because his brother's going to kill him. Now he can't run away from his brother. His brother's got him cornered. And that night, before he faces his brother, it's a dark night. God visits him in the darkness and says, Jacob, I love you. I'm going to strengthen your faith. I'm going to give you back your joy. I'm going to turn you into a powerful man of God. Moses, on the backside of the desert, by his own making, because of his anger problem. God, the, God visits him in the backside of the, to strengthen his tenacity, to increase his faith, to give him more power, to restore his joy. And in that darkness, Moses grew like no one has grown to become an amazing leader. David, running for his life because of sexual proclivities, got him in trouble, hiding in a dark cave. His family's in chaos. His son wants to kill him. It's in that dark cave that God visits him and says, David, as your family's in chaos, as your life is totally a wreck, I'm going to come and I'm going to strengthen your faith. I'm going to bring joy to your life. You're going to be the author of the Psalms and bring joy to God's people throughout generations. I'm going to strengthen your tenacity. You're going to be a man after God's own heart. And that has grown in the darkness. Are y'all with me? Here's what I want you to know this morning. All of us here, because of human beings, have areas of darkness. Those areas that God wants to come with his love and begin to take that darkness and transform it into light and strengthen our tenacity. And there's some people here who need to have their faith strengthened. And there's some people here who need to have their joy renewed. There's some people here who need to have peace in the midst of their life. There's some people here who need some comfort. There's some people here this morning who need some healing. There's some people here this morning who need some direction. There's some people here that need some purpose. There's some people here that need some power that grow best in the darkness because God's love never, never fails. Get it? Good. So what we do now is we're going to remember that God's compassion never fails. We're about ready to take you. Here's what Jesus did. On the night before he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. This bread represents my body. My love for you is so great. My body is going to be broken for you. Eat this. And as often as you eat this, do it in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup. This cup represents my spilled blood. I'm going to die brutally. I'm going to give my life for you. I'm making a new agreement with you. All you have to do is believe in me, and I'll take care of all your sins. It's a new agreement, it's an inward agreement. And this cup is going to be, the blood is shed for you. So drink it. And as often as you drink it, do it in. In just a second, the ushers are going to come. And they're going to pass out the plate here, okay? While we're sitting there, I want you to think of the dark areas in your life. The areas right now that aren't working. Things in your life that you're caving into fear, to worry, questions you have, areas where you're in conflict, where you're feeling it. I want you to think about the darkness. And then before you take communion, just remember that God's love is there to come into the darkness. People grow best in dark areas. Now here's how we do it. 
Yeshua would come down and bring the pasta plate. So as he comes, he take bread and the cup. Everybody with me so far? Okay. We just got brand new trays. So some of these are tight. I've been told by the ushers. So if you reach in for a cup and it doesn't come out, here's what I tell you to do. Reach for another one. Okay? Because in the first service, they're not as quick. And they kept pulling. Oh, no. Okay? And you would think after one person would do that, nobody else would do it again. No, not the 9 o'clock service. They would just keep pulling. And get wine. And not, it's not wine, it's juice. All over everybody. And it was not a good cup. Yeah, it was a mess Okay? So here's what I encourage you to do. When you come to a cup and it won't come out, move one over and pull that one out. Okay? Most of them will come out. Then, you're not going to take communion together. You do it where you're sitting, in your own private. After you pray, you ask God to work in the dark areas of your life, and you take the bread and cup. You do it as a married couple, you sit together with your family, that's awesome. You do it, you take it on your own. And then when they're done delivering the tray, we'll come up and have a little thank you for the close. Okay? This is a time that God instituted for the church to take time to always remember that God's compassion never fails. Even when you're in a dark place and you're tempted to think of God. Let's bow forward and pray. Father, we thank you today for your amazing incredible love and compassion. Where sin abounds, grace abounds so much more. So Father, we ask today, as we remember what Christ has done for every person in this room, may we be reminded that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available for us today. Nobody here, no circumstance here, is beyond the reach of your power, is beyond the reach of your comfort, is, is beyond the reach of your healing. So as we recall the dark areas of our life, may we do so with hope that in our darkness, your love will come to us strengthen our faith and our resolve to be your people. Move now in our midst, for in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're gluten-free, we have some trays in the middle of that there that you're welcome to. If you